Hi, my name is Luke Johnson. Um, I'm an individualized humanities instructor here in the Northern Virginia area. And today I'm doing this shoot from Goose Creek in Middleburg, Virginia. The reason for that is that this is a really wonderful spot that only a few natives know about. Um, but also, as I was composing this talk that I'm about to give, um, I used the river to sort of meditate on a lot of the concepts. And um, yeah, without further ado, I'll let the, the talk and the river do the talking. Okay. So, it's called The Dry Salvages and Temporality. A philosopher untrained in the art of poetic analysis examines the conception of time in Eliot's celebrated poem. It stands to reason inordinate amounts of ink have been spilt, turning out symbolic inferences in encombium for how this masterpiece, masterpiece perfectly fits, bravely defies poetic customs. Perhaps many have exhumed significantly more substantive themes from the poem. One would have to assume this much. The dry salvages dares you to grapple with issues ranging from the collective unconscious to the healing salve of the incarnation. Has all this been systematically expressed, though? Has someone tried to make all the pieces fit? Given Eliot's fixation with temporality in the poem, why not first explicate his concept of time, test its durability, and examine how the other themes flowing through the stanzas fit into that conceptualization? Can we disrobe and lay bare the philosophical skeleton dressed up by El Eliot? Is this fundamental scaffolding familiar to us philosophers? If so, where have we seen it before in the history of philosophy? Somehow I'm going to do all this in this short video. <laughs> so, I have a confession. I don't know anything about this poem. I, I really don't know anything about analyzing poems in general. I debated doing some research and seeing what some other clever people had to say about the third poem in the quartet. All of that seems so endless and intimidating. If I waded into it, I might not have the courage to come before you and pretend that I'm offering some new insight. Plus, would it not defeat the purpose of a philosopher examining the poem with clear eyes? What I will provide you may or may not be novel. It may or may not have any legitimacy. When first proposing this project, my instincts detected that there was a very complex understanding of time at work in the piece. But that's about as far as the instincts got me. Just a hunch. My first close reading appeared to validate those instincts and allowed me to devise this talk into five general headers. The ground of all being, the nature of the past, the nature of the future, permanent milestones, personal identity, and the unification of time in Christ. That actually might be six. <laughs> oh well. I feel a bit ridiculous examining even one of these themes in the short time allotted. Perhaps the ruminations here will prime the pump for a more explorative future project. Before launching into our task, we might be well served to point out that examining these features of time in the dry salvages is more than a pleasant way to pass the, uh, er, well, time. <laughs> Eliot may offer us real philosophical insight into the nature of time. Whether that conception of time is unique and incomplete or is in harmony with an already existing idea of time will be decided in our inclusion. So on with it. The ground of all being. Throughout the dry salvages, there seem to be three concepts that can stand in for one another. Time, the limitlessness of certain bodies of water, be they river, sea, or ocean, and the grounding substrate of all being. Eliot was certainly not the first thinker to analogize the three concepts, but he may have demonstrated the greatest mastery in doing so. The idea that time, deep time, is somehow oceanic, eternal, and yes, a god of some variety is made in the opening of stanza one. I do not know much about gods, but I think that the river is a strong brown god, sullen, untamed, and intractable. This god is not a mere Olympian god, but something more encompassing. This god is the substrate of all being. It interpenetrates all things and sustains them. His rhythm was present in the nursery bedroom, in the rank alanthanus of the April dooryard, in the smell of grapes on the autumn table, and the evening circle in the winter gaslight. And when those items of contingency disintegrate, they return to the bowels of the oceanic abyss, and we are reminded of our past and the transience of all things temporal when it turns them to the surface. 
It tosses up our losses, the torn sign, the shattered lobster pot, the broken oar, and the gear of foreign dead men. We may have effectively established that Eliot saw something analogous to the expanse of waters and that which sustains the universe. However, it may not quite be clear yet how time figures into any of this. Towards the end of this first stanza, Eliot itemizes all the voices of the sea. He saves the tolling bell for last, and it's here where he clearly identifies the ultimate time with the ultimate undergirding being. The tolling bell measures time, not our time, rung by the unhurried groundswell, a time older than the time of chronometers, older than time counted by anxious, worried women. If there is the identification of the limitless waters and a platonic god with time, then time and the eternal are inextricably linked. Time does not exist separately from the eternal, for if the eternal were to disappear, an impossibility, then there would be no time. In this sense, we might be entitled to see that for Eliot, time and the eternal foundation of the universe are one and the same, unless we figured it more prudent to claim that time is a parasitic quality of the foundation and has its own novel form of eternity. Perhaps we are moving too fast. Have we for certain established that Eliot sees the substrate of existence as eternal, and what do we even mean by eternal? When we think of eternity, it would seem that boundlessness would have to be one of its qualities, that there is no point of origination, and there is no terminus extending infinitely in every direction. In stanza two, we get confirmation of this idea of time and the substrate. It is ceaseless along with its trail of refuse. There is no end of it, the voiceless wailing, no end of the withering of withered flowers. To the movement of pain that is painless and motionless, to the drift of the sea and the drifting wreckage, the bones prayer, to death its God, only the hardly barely prayerable prayer of the one annunciation. If time and the eternal are boundless, we need to think about the nature of those extensions, both forwards and backwards. Is Eliot a presentist, or does he think both the past and the future exist in some sense of the word? The nature of the past and the churning eddies of time's river, the past is brought up, or at least some reminder of it. Events do not appear to be frozen implacably in the past, However, husks of those events remain such as chicken coops and the weaponry of a forgotten skirmish. It's as if the substrate of existence sheds the past in the act of becoming the present or the future. Traces of the past seem to exist, but do not fully possess reality. There is something ghostly about them, living on in a plane that is neither real nor completely unreal. But what about the future? The nature of the future in stanza 3, Eliot seems to give the future a similar treatment as the past in a passage that has become a personal favorite. I sometimes wonder if that is what Krishna meant, among other things, or one way of putting the same thing, that the future is a faded song, a royal rose or a lavender spray, of wistful regret for those who are not yet here to regret, pressed between yellow leaves of a book that has never been opened, and the way up is the way down, the way forward is the way back. Here again, we see that future moments don't quite have a real existence. They are waiting to be lived. What's interesting is that Eliot seems to think there is some determinism to these li yet lived moments. They may mirror the past and their rigidity, even though they are yet to be. What's also interesting here is the last line in this passage. Is Eliot intimating something cyclical about eternity and time? Ought we not to think about the substrate of all being extending infinitely, both forwards and backwards? and conceive of it as a loop instead. Would this not make the ground of all being in time not unlike a movie reel that has its previews and closing credits taped together? We'll have to meditate on this a bit more to see if other aspects of the poem favor a cyclical or linear understanding of time and eternity. On to permanent milestones. Despite all the flux of time's river, there does appear to be one event that juts out, piercing through the eddies, we should take note of it now and be prepared to discuss it in much more detail at the paper's end. It looks as if the Incarnation is that special event. Eliot does not explicitly mention the Incarnation in this passage. However, the illusion is powerful enough when he speaks of the ragged rock. 
And the ragged rock in the restless waters, waves wash over it, fogs conceal it. On a halcyon day, it is merely a monument. In navigable weather, it is always a sea mark to lay a course by, but in the somber season, or the sudden fury, is what always was. We will consider the Christology of the poem in greater detail during our contemplation of the final stanza. For now, we need to be prepared to think how a single event can be of significance against the substrate of time and eternity. What purpose does it serve? Can our cognitive apparatus integrate this potential paradox? Personal identity. Thus far, we've attempted to develop an objective, godlike view of the nature of time as Eliot presents it in the poem. We've said little about the subjects of time. Before progressing further, we need to address how an individual is situated in time so we can further develop the larger picture. Eliot appears to not hold the idea that the individual is a static entity that endures through time, rather is something of a process that may, in be, may be in related continuity with the past and future. Presumably, the further we are from an event, be it in the past or the future, we are less connected to it. These are like former and future selves. Human Parfit would be allies here. Fair forward, you who thinking that you are voyaging, you are not those who saw the harbor. Receding are those who will disembark. And a, and a little further down, fair forward, voyagers, O oh seamen, you who came to port, and you whose bodies will suffer the trial and judgment of the sea, or whatever event this is your real destination. So, Krishna, as when he admonished Arjuna on the field of battle, not farewell, but fair forward, voyagers, Unification of time in Christ. Now we can return to the Christology of the poem. Once done with this section, maybe we can see how all these moving parts fit together. It seems there is a corrective for the process that is the individual, meaning perhaps something that can hold the individual together as it trudges through existence, shedding oneself for a future one. This seems to occur in dedication to Christ somehow. But to apprehend the point of intersection, but but to apprehend the point of intersection of the timeless with time, is an occupation for the saint. No occupation either, but something given and taken in a lifetime's death in love, ardor and selflessness and self surrender. Via self surrender, we appear to be able to take ourselves out of the flow of time that is constantly testing and changing us. The self-surrender has to be done with prayer, discipline, and righteous action. The hint half-guessed, the gift half-understood, is incarnation. Here the impossible union of seers of existence is actual. Here the past and future are conquered and reconciled, where action were otherwise movement. Of that which is only moved, and has in it no source of movement, driven by demonic, chthonic powers. Putting it all together... Knowing what we know now, how do we fit all these things together? Um, I had this visual aid. I'm going to skip that. Um, what I want to say here is... I'm not quite sure how it all works. But in dedication to the in our incarnation, man seems to be elevated out of the flux of time. However, this does not mean that somehow he is independent from the substrate. He still needs it for sustenance. So what's the point? Why become a concrete individual before God? It would seem that this understanding of time for Eliot involves both Eastern and Western views. Had there not been the Incarnation, man, like all things, would be sloughed off and returned to the eternal substrate. But because of the Incarnation, there seems to be the possibility of an enduring identity that can be united with God, rather than merely reabsorbed. In the end, we are with God. However, there is gap a gaping difference between God's absorption of us and unity with Him. I see the influence of so many different philosophical, religious traditions on this account of time. Kierkegaard, Hume, and Parfit in regards to the self. Plato and Hegel in regards to the ground of being and becoming. But off the top of top of my head, one account does not match perfectly with it. All of this leaves so many questions that hopefully we can engage here today and throughout our scholarly relationships.